Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Abernathy. I'm a postdoc at SSRL, and I'm here today to talk to you about linear combination fitting. So before I get into the specifics of linear combination fitting, I also wanted to take a moment to point you towards some other resources that are very helpful for all aspects of XAS analysis. Uh, the foremost of these is, of course, Exercise for Everyone by Scott Calvin. It's a classic and incredibly thorough and actually pretty fun to read. Uh, and then there are a variety of resources online as well. So the chief among these, I think, in my opinion, are Matt Newville's channel. Uh, he's one of the authors of Demeter and also one of the authors of Larch. Um, and he's got a full tutorial on his channel of using Larch for XAS analysis. Um, that will include covering parts of uh, LCF analysis, which I'll show you today. Uh, Bruce Trabble, uh, also one of the primary authors of Demeter um, and, and other uh, software, uh, Athena and Artemis within Demeter. Uh, he also has quite a few videos on how to use Athena and Artemis and using them for XAS analysis. These videos are available on YouTube as well as on Vimeo. And then, of course, there are the other videos on our own uh, SSRL Summer School YouTube channel. And a lot of these videos are collated into a playlist uh, for you to see, um, along with some of uh, Matt's, Matt Seebecker's uh, tutorials from his time at the University of Delaware um, in this XS Fitting playlist on YouTube that you can find. Um, so let's get into it. So LCA and LCF. LCF is linear combination fitting. LCA is linear combination analysis. Um, they both mean, they're, you know, honestly, they're usually used interchangeably. LCF is the actual fitting uh, component, whereas uh, LCA includes all other aspects of analysis. So doing statistical analysis between, you know, to compare two different fits, uh, maybe that could be inclusive of using like PCA to determine the number of standards. Um, all of these things I'll get into in more detail uh, in a few minutes. But the essentials of linear combination analysis are using a predefined set of standards uh, and using a weighted sum of a predefined, a predefined set of standards to model a target spectra. So typically, right, this, this target spectra is your data. It's part of your data and you're trying to recreate your data using these standards. So in this case, this is a pretty standard plot for LCA, uh, a linear combination fit, where you have the two standards that were used in the fit here in these dotted lines. You have the fit itself, which is the red line, and then you have the data that is the target being fit to uh, here in the black line. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, you have a residual, which is the difference between the data and the fit. So it's kind of a, it, it, by eye, it's a good way to gauge how close your fit is to your data. Um, in this tutorial and explanation, I'll be covering uh, how to use LCF in a couple different settings. Uh, these include phase identification. So for example, if you're an environmental scientist, you might be interested in identifying the minerals present in a soil or sediment, or perhaps uh, tracking the change in one mineral phase over time you know, uh, with under some reaction conditions. So for example, you might be interested in watching the transformation of ferrohydride into gertite or vice versa over say the span of months under some specified pH salts and solute conditions. Uh, you might also be interested in oxidation state determination. <clears throat> uh, so this could be the case looking at uh, metals in soil again, or metals perhaps at the, the center of a metalloenzyme. So you could say you have like uh, different intermediates of a metalloenzyme trapped, uh, catalytic intermediates trapped, and you can, you know, you could use LCF for this. You could use other techniques also to get at the oxidation state here, um, but you could, you know, calculate the oxidation state at each of these intermediates, or in the case of a soil, you could track changes to an oxidation state of a metal as a soil is subjected to oxidizing or reduced conditions. Uh, you can also, if you have an experiment that you actually run in situ at a beamline uh, where you're collecting, you know, probably very many spectra over the course of an hour or multiple hours, um, you can uh, monitor reaction progress using uh, linear combination fitting, which is a super useful way of looking for intermediates as well as products. Um, so some examples, uh, we can start off with an easy example. This is a, an iron, uh, two iron spectra, iron zanes. Um, and the authors of this study were interested in how the proportion of iron two changed in the sample when you heated it. 
um, and it undergoes a phase change, uh, not the, the iron does, but the, the sample as a whole undergoes a phase change. Um, so uh, you can see the linear combination fit is pre present as these dotted lines and the data are the solid lines. Um, and you can see by fitting, uh, by, by doing your LCF to this data, the authors were able to determine that there's a reduction, for example, of iron two between the two samples. There's like a 60% reduction of, of iron two, roughly. Uh, so that, you know, that's a useful way of using this. Um, you'll notice that uh, you can't really tell how well the LCA uh, models the, the pre-edge peak down here. Uh, that's, that's pretty common. It's difficult to both uh, model features at the, the edge, the white line, these post-edge features, as well as model the pre-edge feature because the pH feature is just so small compared to these other much larger features. Um, so it's not uncommon to have this be poorly modeled. Um, and if you really care about your pre-edge feature, you can get at changes in oxidation state another way using pre-edge analysis. Um, a lot of those videos are also available in the playlist that I mentioned, as well as on our um, summer school page, as well as in Matthew Newville goes uh, through some good examples too in his videos. Um, here's another example. So in this one, we're tracking reaction progress. So uh, this, these are vanadium K-edge zanes. Vanadium is like chromium. Vanadium has a very prominent pre-edge feature, uh, this pre-edge peak that increases in intensity with respect to oxidation state. So vanadium three has just like an itty bitty little peak. Vanadium four has this kind of medium sized peak. And then vanadium five is a very large peak. Um, and so here we were tracking or I should say I was tracking the oxidation of vanadium-4 to vanadium-5 over time. Um, and so this is a, a really handy way to calculate the relative proportions of vanadium-4 uh, and vanadium-5 um, as the reaction progressed um, to get something like a, a plot like this, right? So using linear combination fitting of these two end members, the vanadium-5 standard, which is up top, and the vanadium-4 standard at the bottom, uh, you can do your LCF on each of these sample spectra and get a time series like this with the increasing amount of vanadium-5 over time and a decreasing amount of vanadium-4. You'll notice there are no error bars on this. This is a uh, one sample run. So if I were to put error bars on this, that would likely suggest that those are experimental error bars. So I would have repeated this experiment, say like three or five times. You know, average, taking the average value at each time point uh, from linear combination analysis and then average those and then also gotten either the standard error or standard deviation or something, a 95% confidence interval from that data and plotted that here. Um, it's, it's pretty uncommon that you would actually plot the error bar from the linear combination fitting itself, because when you do linear combination fitting, uh, you do get an error associated with each fit, right? Um, and so it'd be more appropriate to actually just report that error somewhere either, probably not in the caption of the figure, but somewhere in the text, say, for all linear combination fits, errors were plus or minus 10%, let's say, or plus or minus 5% if you're really lucky. Uh, but again, you have to do the homework and, and take a look at what errors are actually fit, um, spit out by your fitting software uh, with each fit, um, and you can do it that way. Um, but you can see it's very useful for uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, tracking uh, reaction progress in this way. Uh, one other note I want to make about this data set um, is it's very noisy. Uh, you can just see that off the bat. It's very coarse also, especially the steps taken along the edge. Uh, there are reasons for that which aren't important, but what it what is critical is that you'll notice that the uh, the standards are about as noisy as the samples are. And this doesn't have to be, be the case. You could actually totally do this experiment and then just collect like really high quality standards, right? So these standards, they were collected, it's the same, like all of this whole reaction, the standards were collected in the same conditions. Um, and so as long as, as the standards are collected under the same conditions like that, you can get higher resolution and then do your fitting with these higher resolution standards and that's fine. Um, I'm sorry, by higher resolution, I just mean uh, uh, less noisy standards. Um, however, you do not want to <laughs> collect uh, your standards or your samples at a different resolution from one another. And so this would mean uh, if you're at SSRL, uh, resolution is controlled by uh, the crystal set that you're using, as well as the vertical slits. Um, 
which allow you know beam from the mono the monochromator to come through. So a way to have a resolution discrepancy, for example, would be to measure all of your samples with a vertical slit of one millimeter, and then to measure your standards with a vertical slit of like 1.2 millimeters. This would result in your standards having a lower resolution than your uh, samples, and a lower resolution, uh, a lower resolution in with your zanes actually tends to erode sharp features. So. A lower resolution would reduce the intensity of this pre-edge peak. It would reduce the intensity of any shoulders or peaks on the edge. Um, and that would skew your results quite a bit because if you're, uh, if you're vanadium five, in this case, vanadium five is supposed to have a taller pre-edge feature. If it's at lower resolution, it's gonna be much lower in intensity. Um, and so will vanadium four. Uh, this will also be lower in intensity, and that would lead you to overestimate one phase versus the other. Uh, likely in this scenario, I think it would lead you to overestimate the amount of vanadium-5 in your data, because while the vanadium-5 is lower, the vanadium-4 is also lower. Um, and that would just be bad news um, for your data accuracy. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Keep your slits, uh, the vertical slits at the same same size, same gap for your samples and your standards, and you'll be good to go. Um, yeah, so uh, we can move on to this example. Uh, this is a pretty, I think, good teachable example that I'll actually, I'll get into a little bit more in the tutorial part later, um, where I leveraged uh, this combo method described in, in this reference here, it's Manso et al, 2012, to calculate the average oxidation state of manganese in soil. Um, a couple of things about this, again, just like in that iron data that I showed you earlier, uh, it can be difficult to model every, every feature in your spectra equally well. So in this case, even though this uh, fitting library, and I'll show you what this uh, the standards library from this paper looks like, it's incredibly comprehensive. Even though it's incredibly comprehensive, uh, we can't model the pre-edge feature as well as we can model, say, the edge or the post edge or the white line of the, these manganese compounds. Um, so you just keep that in mind. Um, this doesn't mean it's a bad fit per se. Um, in this case, the, the fit was still good. And if you wanted to really be um, provide as much evidence as you could about the as many lines of evidence as you could about the oxidation state for this manganese, I would I would do a pre edge analysis on this pre edge peak calculate the oxidation state from the pre-edge and then, and then compare that to the oxidation state obtained from this linear combination fitting. Um, likewise, as I've mentioned, you know, you can determine oxidation state here. This is a, a, an example of where the authors were interested in determining the, the amount of arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 present in a clay that was then fired into a ceramic material. <clears throat> um, and you can notice a few key features about this. Uh, there's some misfit. Uh, at the white line, for example, the, the fit, the LCF fit is much more intense than the actual white line of the data. And then it looks like we're overfitting the data here at the edge, right where the arsenic three white line should be. Um, and so this, this can tell you something. If this, if you were doing this fit, this, um, don't get me wrong, this is, I need to say first and foremost, this is not like a, a bad fit. Um, but what this kind of fit tells you is that the the environment of arsenic in your samples or in the samples here differs from the environment of arsenic uh, in the, in, I'm sorry, in the standards differs from the environment of arsenic in uh, the standards. So um, in particular, you can tell that um, in all likelihood, these, these could have been like arsenic salts, right? And so they're, the white lines are gonna be a little more intense, a little possibly even narrower in here, and so that's gonna to lead to this uh, overestimate of intensity for the fit. Um, and then to be honest, it just, it doesn't seem like there's that much arsenic three present, especially in, in this one. And so 6% is likely a bit of an overestimate, but the study in, in uh, the study in question, you know, they did their work and they, they provide error bars and everything. So, um, but just be aware when you see a fit like this, it's likely indicative that your standards and your spectra, your samples, uh, the bonding environment for your element of interest is different. Um, and so you can keep that in mind. 
Um, so here's another way, maybe a slightly more sensitive way to do LCF on zanes, especially if you're talking about uh, zanes like arsenic, which are very featureless generally, right at the edge. You can see even, even these two, you can kind of maybe see there's like a little like broadening here, right? Or broadening here, but it, it's really hard to see. Well, if you transform that into first derivative space, uh, the first derivative of the zanes is really sensitive to the shape of the edge. So any peaks or shoulders in the edge that would be really slight, if you're just looking at the zanes, become a little more, a little more apparent um, in the first derivative plot. And so at least for your, for actually looking at the data, um, you can see that if you apply the same kinds of standards, you, you can fit it a little more cleanly. So in this case, it's the same scenario. There's arsenic three and arsenic five fitting to arsenic associated with iron. Um, and you can see the fits are very clean, um, very neat. Uh, this data was, was fit very well. Um, and so this is an advantage of fitting in first derivative space. So if your fits don't look super great in zanes, in, in energy, in, sorry, in just the mu of E space, Try fitting it again in first derivative space to see if that can provide you any clues as to which features in the zanes are leading to your misfit. And ideally, that will tell you something about uh, which standard you're missing, um, particularly if there's like a peak or, so, or a shoulder in, in your sample that isn't being modeled correctly by the standards that you have that, that will tell you that there's a standard there that um, has that feature that you, that you are missing. Um, and I'll show you an example of that uh, in a little bit. Um, yep. So uh, we can move on. So those are some examples, hopefully to motivate you for the power of linear combination analysis and its utility. Um, now we can talk about some uh, guidelines for going into LCA analysis um, that are, you know, important for ensuring that you're not only doing the work well, but that you're, you know, you don't have to do it over and over again. So it's better to go into this with clean data with data that's well normalized, and we'll talk about what that means now. So let's say you, you come to SSRL, and let's say you're collecting uh, some XAS uh, on like a 3D transition metal. So in this case, that 3D transition metal is manganese. <clears throat> and in all likelihood, um, if you're at one of the bulk XAFs beam lines, uh, which you probably are if you're collecting this kind of data, you're gonna be collecting a calibration scan with each sample scan that you take. And that it will be accomplished by having a uh, foil. So typically like a metal foil, if you're at a 3D transition metal in line with your, with your sample, um, or if you're say at beamline 4.3 and you're collecting sulfur XAS, uh, then you'd use a chemical standard like sodium thiosulfate or if you're at beamline 11.2 and you're collecting arsenic K edge data, you might use like a gold foil calibrated to the L3 edge. Um, now what's important about this is, is you'll use each calibration scan to apply an energy shift to that calibration scan to get it to line up with published values because we, we know what the energy of manganese foil should be. That's you know, well established. Um, and you'll need to align your um, your calibration scan to that published value. And the way that that's typically done, as I'll show you in a few minutes, is by uh, moving, assigning the energy for the first derivative, the maximum of the first derivative, I should say the first maximum of the first derivative, uh, to the published value. Um, and so at SSRL, we use values from this X-ray data booklet. Uh, this is available online as well as at each beamline. Um, and I believe for manganese, the value for manganese foil from this booklet is something along the lines of 6539 EV. Um, it's about this, uh, maybe a few tenths of an EV off. Now, this is actually the, the default value in Athena is 6539. Um, however, if you want to use standards from a collaborator or from another paper in the literature or from a database, you should be aware of the fact that the people who collected that spectra may have calibrated it to a different energy. So for example, this is a, a manganese spectra from one of these standards libraries. And the authors who collected this and published this spectra, the black one, they calibrated it to 6537.7 EV. They calibrated the, the foil. It's, you know, it's corresponding foil. So if I want to use, say, I want to use this spectra to do some fitting with, um, with data that I've collected here at SSRL, that I've calibrated, 
the reference foil to 6539 on, I'll need to apply, even though this is the sample spectra, right? This isn't the actual manganese foil spectra. I'll need to apply a 1.3 EV shift uh, to this spectra as obtained from the database in order to have it line up with the calibration grid for the data that I collected at SSRL. So just be aware that you need to take some care um, to do that. Um, and this may involve hunting down literature citations uh, for spectra that you find online. I can go on all sorts of uh, rabbit trails, you know, trying to hunt that information down, or you can just email the author um, if they're around. Usually people are happy to uh, answer questions like that. Um, in addition to the calibration, you need to take care that your spectra are normalized consistently. So there are two examples here of some Iridium L3 uh, zines. Uh, you can see that their normalization differs from each other uh, a fair amount here out at higher energies, uh, where the intensity, the normalization, the way that uh, in this case, these were normalized in uh, Athena. So there was a post edge line applied and you can tell that the, the post edge line differed between these two. Um, and when I say they need to be normalized consistently, I don't mean that you need to apply the same normalization parameters to every spectra. Um, if you've got a clean data set, you can do that and the, it'll be great. You know, But oftentimes if you're working in environmental or biological si systems, you're working with really noisy spectra, uh, you have to average a lot, a lot of scans together to get any meaningful uh, XAFs out of or, or zanes. Um, and so you'll need to play around with your normalization parameters. And the goal that you're going for, um, as is outlined um, in some of the other videos on the channel, is to have your spectra basically like follow one another. So there may be chemical shifts in the data, like you can see this red line, it doesn't, you know, you don't need it, you don't need the red spectra to lie on top of the black spectra here. This uh, difference in energy here actually tells you something about the bonding environment of, of the iridium in each sample. However, out here at higher energies, they do fall on top of each other. And that's, uh, that's a good indicator that your normalization is consistent. And importantly, if you were to draw a horizontal line through um, this intensity value of one here, that should bisect the oscillations uh, out at higher energies. Um, in order, so that's a good indicator that you've done your normalization correctly. Uh, here are some more structured zanes. Uh, these are again manganese zanes. You can see that the zanes on the left are well normalized. Um, they're manganese three spectra. They're all clustered together. They follow one another very well. Um, they lie on top of each other more or less. That's a good ind indicator uh, that these uh, have been well normalized. The manganese four spectra here in purple, it oscillates. You can see it oscillates around the manganese three spectra. Um, and you've got a nice little, uh, what appears to be an isobestic point. This may or may not be that, but when you see points like these, that's a good indicator that uh, you're on the right track with your normalization. <clears throat> Over here, it's the same spectra, but I've messed with the normalization quite a bit to show you what it can look like when it's wrong. Uh, so a good way to tell that this is wrong is to uh, see for one, the manganese three spectra are now significantly different from one another. They're not on top of each other. They're, they've got a spread in intensity um, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But I'd say the biggest indicator that these aren't well normalized is actually the intensity of this purple spectra, the manganese four spectra. So this is where when you're doing normalization, if you have some chemical or physical knowledge about your samples or the standards that you're normalizing, it can help to ensure, it can help to inform the way that you do your normalization to know that uh, you're on the right track. So in this case, I know manganese four, right? It has one less electron uh, formally. It's formal charges, one less electron than manganese three. Um, and because of that, it has an additional hole. So manganese four has an additional hole. And so when you're doing the XAS analysis, uh, the, you're collecting the spectra, um, you have another basically final state that you can excite that the excited core electron into. Um, and that additional excited state, or ex uh, sorry, that additional um, hole for the excited electron to go into uh, should result in a more intense white line. So I'd expect for this to be more intense than the manganese three, uh, which it is over here. Um, so that can be another good tool uh, for you to use if you've got some knowledge about your, your system. 
Um, additionally, uh, it's, you know, we, we live in and collect data in the real world. Um, and so we don't always collect perfect spectra. Sometimes we have uh, errors built into our spectra. And these we call glitches. Uh, they arise from very small defects in the silicon, at least at SSRL, in the silicon crystals, crystal sets that are used um, at, at the bulk x of beam lines. Um, they're typically very small, usually no more than a few points. And so what you can do is actually just in Athena or in Larch um, or in other software, you can just, go, or even in Excel, you can just go in and, and remove those points. And it's very important that you do this um, because linear combination fitting, it actually minimizes the square of the difference between your data and the fit. So if you've got, you know, all of your data is kind of consistent with one another, and then all of a sudden you've got one point that's like way up here, um, well, the square of that difference is going to be really big and it's going to make your fit try to compensate for that difference and it'll lead to erroneous results. So um, even though having like a flat line, so this red line right here is the deglitched uh, part of the deglitched spectra, even though that doesn't look great, right? It's like a straight line connecting two points. Um, it's, it's better to have this for your fitting than to have a point way up here. Um, finally, you can also do uh, LCA on XFs. So this is also a common way to look for phase changes um, because XFs is more sensitive to, um, you know, select near neighbors, um, whereas Zanes is really selective for like a lot of multiple scattering interactions as well as electronic transitions. <clears throat> and so fitting in XFs, uh, doing LCF on the XFs can be a good way to track phase transformations, especially if you're working in an environmental system. Um, and you need to prepare your data for XFs LCF analysis in the same way as you would for Zane. So you need to make sure your calibrations are done correctly, ensure that your normalization is done correctly, ensure, ensure that your uh, background subtraction, um, which are covered in other videos, uh, is done correctly, or at least consistently um, across all of your spectra. Um, and then the only uh, note is that you need to set your value of E0. So um, I'll show you in a few minutes how E0 is typically calculated or measured in uh, fitting software in like Athena or large and some of your software. Um, so it's important when you do your fitting uh, with XFs to just essentially like pick a value for E0 from one of your samples and enforce that value across all of them. Um, know that that is the, the wrong value, right? If you're fitting a change, well, E0 should also change as the phases in your sample change. Um, however, uh, you, you, know, you have to have the same value of E0 in order to align all of your spectra with one another. And so the idea is at least it'll, it should be somewhat equally incorrect for all of your, all of your spectra. Um, and in that way, you can actually pull out some useful information. So it's kind of a, a funny uh, back and forth way on, on the reasoning there, um, but it, it really does uh, work um, and it, it makes sense um, if you really spend some time thinking about it. Uh, yeah, so I, this is honestly, this is from the same paper that I've shown a couple examples from already. So you can see that uh, just using these two um, standards down here in black, it's a, a hexagonal burnicite and a triclinic burnicite. So these are manganese four oxides. You're able to track I, I assume from this paper, it looks like you're tracking the, the authors are tracking the reduction of hexagonal burnicite into triclinic burnicite. Um, so super useful um, tracking phase, very subtle. I should, I should add, this is a very subtle phase transformation. Um, so it's, it's nice that you can track it in this way. Um, okay, so we've done some, uh, we've, we've taken a look at uh, some motivation for doing LCF and, and what you need to do to prepare your spectra for LCF. Uh, let's talk about assessing um, LCF. So to do that, you can assess your goodness of fit. So a lot of software programs that you use, uh, Athena and Large, you know, are the ones that I'll show you. So they both uh, spit out a couple statistical parameters for each fit that you do. That includes an R factor, a chi-squared, and a reduced chi-squared value. Um, a couple of points on these, chi-squared is the actual fitting statistic that's minimized in the course of fitting. So a few slides ago, when I was talking about glitches, I mentioned that, you know, it, uh, LCF minimizes the difference between there the square of the difference between your data and fit uh, that was referencing chi squared. <clears throat> so this is minimized in the course of fitting. Uh, and you can see over here, 
Uh, this is the equation for chi squared. It's uh, again, the square of your data minus fit divided by this value eta sub i squared. Uh, this is actually the measurement uncertainty and it's the measurement uncertainty for each data point. So this is the measurement uncertainty for data point i. Uh, this is a really hard value to estimate or know for, for all XAS, but especially for zines. And so it's often estimated as one in fitting software, um, which, you know, that's, uh, that is an assumption in the fitting model. Um, if one day we can get a better estimate on this uncertainty, we can update chi-squared and it can be a more relevant parameter. Right now, chi-squared is really useful for the actual fitting, but if you wanna say compare two fits to one another, <coughs> pardon me, uh, what you'd wanna do is take chi-squared and divide it by the degrees of freedom in your fit. And this will normalize chi-squared to the number of free parameters that you have. And this value is actually given to you. So this is automatically calculated by a lot of the software. But uh, importantly, you can see it's, uh, you know, your chi-squared divided by the number of independent points in your zanes minus the number of variables that you use to fit it. So for example, um, the number of independent points in zanes, it's not the number of data points that you have in your spectra that you're fitting. It's actually, it's a lower number. So typically it's a number more than 20. Um, Athena, Athena and Larch will estimate this number for you. Um, I Really typical numbers that I see when I, I work on this are like 26 to 28 independent points, which is probably, uh, to be honest, probably a slight overestimate. Um, so I'd say like 20 is, is a conservative estimate for an IDP. And then the number of variables, this could just be the number of standards that you use to fit your data. Um, so uh, finally, you also have the R factor. So the R factor looks very similar to chi-squared. Um, it's uh, the square of the data minus fit, uh, but instead of being divided by this uncertainty, you're just dividing it by your data squared um, at each point. Um, and this makes R factor essentially, if you were to multiply it by 100, essentially a percentage measure of misfit between your data and fit. And so it's a really convenient factor, a really convenient measure to use when you're comparing two spectra. <clears throat> if you wanna compare two fits to the same data, um, I would either use the reduced chi-squared or your R factor to do that. Um, so say you do do two fits, you've done two fits on, on a data set and you wanna ask, um, hey, is this fit correct or is this fit correct? Uh, well, unfortunately, you can't really ask your statistics these kind of existential questions. Software doesn't like <laughs> philosophy questions like that. Uh, but what you can ask is, hey, is uh, fit one significantly more likely to be correct relative to fit two? And to do that, um, it's most common to use the R factor for this. And we take the R factor and we plug it into this test that was developed for crystallography um, outlined in this paper um, that we call the Hamilton test. Um, the Hamilton test is very straightforward. Uh, you just take the ratio of your better fit to your worst fit or the better fit to the fit that you're comparing it to. We call that ratio X. Next, you take the number of independent points of your better fit and subtract from that the number of variables in your better fit. Again, both of these parameters are given to you by your fitting software. <clears throat> and we divide that number by two. We call that number A. And last, we take the number of variables in our better fit we subtract from that the number of variables in our worst, in our uh, comparison fit, or alternatively, say you have the same number of variables in both fits. Say you have uh, three components that used to fit both fits, uh, but you changed one of the components between the two fits. Well, in that case, you've, you've changed one parameter between the two fits. So this would actually be one. Um, so maybe, uh, so anyway, so in that case, you'd have one here, one over two is 0.5, and then B would be 0.5 in that case. So. Um, B is the, the one half of the difference in the number of variables it takes to go from one fit to the other. Um, and finally, you take these values of X, A, and B, and you plug them into uh, this regularized lower incomplete beta function. Um, so you don't have to calculate this yourself. We call this I sub R. Um, you can, there are plenty of calculators online that will do it for you. Um, they just ask for your values of A, B, and X. And so you put these parameters in and you'll, you'll get your um, information out. So let's go to a quick example. Um, in this example, uh, this is just gonna be a very straightforward um, example. 
uh, of LCF and, and we'll use it to go through the Hamilton test. So to start with, I've opened up Athena. Uh, this is some copper K-edge data. Um, and I, I'll just show you the data really quick. Um, the data is a, a series, a mixture series of uh, copper two. Oops, I, sorry, I highlighted too many things. There we go. Um, it's a mixture of uh, copper two mixed with a uh, reductant and varying ratios of copper two to reductant. Um, and so we have a, here the blue spectra, you can see it's, it's shifted down in energy relative to the green. This is the more reduced spectra. This is actually two times the amount of reductant to the amount of copper two. The screen spectra is two times the amount of copper two to reductant. And then this red spectra is a one-to-one -one mixture of the two. And so this is a great system for uh, kind of looking at how LCF works because all we wanna do is ask, hey, is this one-to-one -one mixture a 50-50 mixture of the blue and green spectra? And that's a question that LCF is, is very keen to answer. <clears throat> so we'll go down to the linear combination fitting tab. Um, and I'm going to select the sample that I will um, fit with. And then I've already checked the boxes for both of my two standards. I'll click this box that says use marked groups. Um, and you'll notice I am gonna do this fit uh, from minus 20 below the inflection point of the zanes. So I've talked about E naught, actually I'll just show you here. Um, so I've talked about E naught already, right? So here's E naught, it's this little dot circle with the, the crosshairs in it. Um, and this is calculated, this is uh, obtained by taking the first derivative of, of this, the maximum of the first derivative, this energy, it's 89, 84.13 or so. It looks like here it's uh, 89, 83.9. So I was a little off. Um, so anyway, this is the E naught energy here. Uh, so anyway, the way Athena works is it, it gives you your fit range in terms of your E-naught energy. Um, and I'll go over this fit range a little more in a future example. <clears throat> but for this case, uh, I've got both of the initial guesses for the weights are 0.5. That's an appropriate initial guess. Um, I've checked these boxes uh, to force my weights to sum to one, as well as to have all weights between zero and one. Um, and I've done that because uh, I've normalized all these spectra and I know they're normalized consistently so I can force all the weights to sum to one. Um, and so with that, I'll go ahead and fit this group uh, and it fits very quickly. Uh, let's take a look at the fit. You can see our two components, the green and the purple. <clears throat> Actually, can I plot the, let's see. No, that's fine. Um, so you can see that we're modeling uh, this. This fit models the edge very well. Uh, there's a little bit of misfit at the top of the white line, as well as in the post edge region of the white line. But overall, this is a very clean fit. We'll take a look at the fit results. <clears throat> the fit results are presented in a text format here. Uh, you can see this is the, the number of data points that were fit. Uh, I fit it with two variables. I'm not quite sure why this is saying one variable. Um, and then uh, 28.1 independent points. So this is the estimate on the independent points. Um, you can see the R factor is, is very low. Um, the chi-squared value is also very low and the reduced chi-squared value is also very low. Um, and then we can see that uh, indeed in this case, uh, this sample is almost a 50-50 mixture of the two standards. It's 51% uh, of one and 49% of the other. Uh, so very close to 50-50. So that's uh, useful. Um, what I would do next is I'd save this as a column, as a column file. So this is just a text file. You can save it and then you can open it up in MATLAB or Excel or R or something and, and mess around with it later uh, if you'd like. Um, so now that you've seen how this fit is done, let's go back to the presentation. Um, and we'll take a look at the Hamilton test. So uh, here on the left, this is the fit that I just showed you, uh, two standards. Uh, and then over here, I've repeated the fit again, but I added in two additional standards. Each of these has the residual. You can see first just by eyeballing it that uh, the residual uh, decreased uh, with the addition of the two additional standards, as well as uh, the fit actually only wanted one of those additional standards and it forced the other standard down to basically be zero and weighted it with a zero, it didn't like it. Uh, but for the sake of this um, tutorial, this example, we'll just pretend like it used that fourth standard. 
so that we have a two standard difference between these two. It'll just make the math of the Hamilton test a little, a little more clear um, between these, but uh, not really that much more clear. So moving forward, you can see the R factors are also, they're both very good and they're both very similar. Uh, you can see that including the two additional standards lowered the R factor of this fit by about 10%. So to do the Hamilton test, we'll set up a table. Uh, we'll set up the two R factors and we'll take the ratio. So again, this is the ratio of the better fit to the worst fit. And so again, you can see there's about a 10% difference between the two. Uh, we'll take the number of independent points from Athena as well as the number of variables. So two standards versus four standards. Uh, we'll calculate the degrees of freedom. This is the NIDP of the better fit, the fit with four standards minus the four variables. We'll take half of that to get our value of A, and then we'll take, uh, to calculate B, it was a two standard difference between this fit and this fit. So divide that by two by two and you get one. So we've got, this is our value of X, our value of A, our value of B. Plug these into a calculator and you get a value of I sub R of uh, about 0.27. So what this means is that there's a 25% chance that the improvement, this 10% improvement in this fit uh, is due to um, random variation or fitting noise in the data or you know maybe noise in the standards that fit to the data better. That's what I mean by random chance, you know. Um, so anyway, there's a 27% chance that this improvement is, is basically due to random variation alone. Um, and so typically, just like in a lot of other, using a lot of other statistical tests, uh, you can enforce like a confidence interval of, or sorry, a 5% cutoff. So you can think of that as like a 95% confidence interval. Um, and so this is far outside of a 5% confidence uh, interval that, or a confidence that this wouldn't be due to random variation. So we're just gonna reject this fit too. Um, in this case, the Hamilton test tells us that adding two standards to this fit to get a 10% increase when the fit is already this, this good, um, that's not worth it statistically. Uh, here's another example that you don't actually need the Hamilton test for, but it's a very satisfying example to use the Hamilton test on. Uh, you can just clearly see that the fit on the left is better than the fit on the right. Um, the fits are the exact same. They both use nine standards, uh, except for the fit on the left includes nine standards plus an additional standard. This fit highlights the importance of making sure that your standards in, you know, will have features that match up with the features present in your samples. So in these nine standards, uh, you can see it's it, of the nine, it's actually only using three in the fit. Uh, the others were rejected and it's still not modeling. It's not modeling this post-edge satellite feature. It's not modeling the white line. It's not modeling the pre-edge, et cetera. But once we include uh, this, this one standard, um, it still uses about four, four standards to model the, uh, the Zanes region and it rejected the others. But now we're modeling the pre-edge feature a bit better. We're modeling the shoulder better, modeling the white line much better. And we're actually attempting now to model this uh, post-edge satellite feature. So, you know, you could kind of just eyeball this and actually you could just look at the R factors and tell that this is a better fit. But when you run the Hamilton test through this, it, uh, it, it basically tells you beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is a better fit and including this additional standard to get this better fit is very worth it. Um, very, very worth it. So uh, now to discuss some limitations to LCA, um, the first of which you can only fit with the standards you have. That's kind of the example that I just showed you where without that, uh, in this case, it was this uh, Richterite sample. So without this Richterite sample, we'd kind of be out of luck in modeling the spectra. So you need to have the right standards. Um, <clears throat> there are plenty of standards libraries and databases that you can pull from. Here are two uh, citations for uh, publications that have pretty extensive uh, manganese uh, databases. Uh, with this one, you might have to email the authors. I can't remember if they have it available or not, but it's a very comprehensive database. And then and then this one, this is uh, the paper that established the combo method that I showed you earlier um, that I'll be showing you in a tutorial in a few minutes. Uh, and then this is a publication that has a very good uh, iron library. So iron, iron Zanes library. 
Uh, some additional limitations. So you need to consider the mode of data collection. So if you're collecting fluorescence data, <coughs> pardon me, uh, fluorescence data versus uh, transmission data. So with fluorescence data, if you're collecting with a thick sample, your spectra will be more heavily weighted by the element of interest that's towards the front of the sample. Because you know, even if you're getting photons through your sample, like say you're doing like nickel fluorescence, and you just have really low amounts of nickel in your sample, you'll still be getting photons all the way through your sample and through the ion chamber and through your reference foil. Um, but any fluorescence that you're getting out of it will be impeded both by the matrix that the sample is in as well as by other nickel that's in, you know, in front of that sample. So you'll be preferentially sampling uh, your element of interest towards the front of the sample. <clears throat> so this isn't a problem if your sample is homogeneous. Uh, but it can be if there's any kind of depth or a depth profile to your sample. Um, likewise, this is uh, very closely related. You want to avoid having the scale of mixing in your sample close to the scale of beam penetration. So uh, to illustrate this point, let's pretend like you're working at an energy at, a, at an edge whose uh, beam penetration is about uh, four microns in depth. So you can get beam you know, one, the average uh, length that that the x-rays can get into your sample is about four microns. Um, but in that sample also, let's say that you have particles like uh, large particles, uh, maybe in a soil that have uh, an oxidized crust uh, where your element of interest is both present in an oxidized form in a crust. And then there's a reduced core. So your element of interest is both oxidized and reduced but the oxidized crust is say two to five microns thick. Well, using fluorescence, you're gonna be uh, preferentially sampling the uh, oxidation state of your element of interest in the crust relative to the core. And so your fluorescence spectra are going to artificially uh, say that most of your element of interest is oxidized. Uh, so a good way around this is to know something about your sample before taking it to the synchrotron, or additionally, you can run um, different types of edge analysis. So you can do other kinds of analysis. For example, you can do um, K-edge and L-edge analysis. And if the L-edge analysis shows that your sample is more oxidized than your K-edge analysis, knowing that the K-edge analysis will, will penetrate further into your sample, then you know that there's some depth stratification in, in your sample, right? So the L-edge will be saying that it's more oxidized and the K-edge will be saying, oh, maybe it's more 50-50 from both of those data taken together, you can know that there's, oh, there's probably some kind of crust going on. Uh, you know, you could have a system like this happening or, or maybe some other comparable system. Uh, when working in transmission, uh, transmission is, is more forgiving about depth uniformities because you're collecting the absorption through the sample, <clears throat> right? Uh, but you can also get distortions if you've got non-uniformities kind of in the lateral plane of the sample. So if you imagine, the beam is intersecting your sample. There's like a, a plane, right? Maybe like a, I think typically like a 10 square millimeter plane. If you've got your, uh, the slits for like your vertical slit set to one millimeter and your horizontal slit set to like 10 millimeters, you'll have roughly, you know, you can imagine 10 square millimeters of uh, a 10 square millimeter plane going through your, your sample. Um, and so anyway, if you have non-uniformities across that plane, you'll have, it, it'll basically cause a difference in how, how much beam is absorbed through your sample and where, and that can lead to uh, almost the exact same kind of um, non-uniformities you would have in fluorescence uh, with your scale of mixing. So just, just be aware of that. Just make sure your sample is well mixed or you're working on a, a spatial scale that will allow you to circumvent any kind of non-uniformities like that. Some tips, um, and then we'll get to the tutorial. When you're doing LCF, allow the weights to equal more than one if you suspect that, uh, you know, if you, if you essentially, if you're using standards from someone else, from a collaborator, from a database, and you don't know how they were normalized, and it seems like maybe their normalization doesn't quite match the normalization of your samples, and you can't get the normalization of your samples to match the normalization of the standards, um, in that case, it's it's okay to allow the weights to equal more than one of your standards as a, as a way to kind of compensate for this difference in normalization. Um, yeah, uh, and then 
Uh, finally, I've, I've mentioned this already, but just do your best to ensure that your standards and samples uh, were collected with the same energy resolution. So ideally, that means collected. I mean, honestly, ideally, that means collected at the same beam line. But uh, under more practical terms, just try to make sure that you know the same kind of crystal set was used, and maybe the same like vertical slits uh, were used if you can find that information. Um, and now we'll move on to the tutorial. Um, I'll try to keep this relatively short. Uh, through in the tutorial, we'll be looking at manganese again uh, and soil samples. Um, we're gonna look at data normalization quality. We'll go over um, some standards and we'll use PCA to decide how many standards to use in the fitting. We'll do some fitting and then we'll calculate an estimated manganese oxidation state. Okay, so to begin, uh, I will take us to large, um, and we are going to be looking at this uh, data set. So uh, right off the bat, I want to show you there are eight sample spectra in this data set, and then just a whole lot of standards. Go ahead and import them all. Uh, now, obviously, it would be unwise to try to spend time iterating through all of these standards to try to you know see which work the best and yeah yeah trying you know unfortunately in large you can't fit this many standards to actually I shouldn't say unfortunately it's probably a good thing that you can't fit this many standards to a sample um, that's too many too many variables uh, to start in your fit so um, but let's start at the top shall we so let's begin by plotting all eight of our our sample spectra i'll plot these as flattened i've already done some normalization on these so they're pretty close um you can see some hallmarks already that these samples were very dilute and they were in a crystalline matrix um, you can see from the pre-edge area here there's a lot of scattering that happens um, from the high uh, silicate uh, composition of the soil they were in and then you can also tell from how noisy they look that it was pretty low concentration as concentrations of manganese present. Um, we can kind of see from these zanes, uh, there appears to be discrepancy in how, and possibly, so this is interesting. You see how some of these zanes are, uh, their pre-edge is much higher than the pre-edge of the others. Uh, this could be due, but um, as you follow them up to the edge, the edge, they lie on top of each other on the edge. Uh, this is an indicator of one of two things. Either um, we have a, a different type of manganese in a different oxidation state or a bonding environment for manganese in these samples that's leading to an extra peak and a more intense peak. So if you were to do peak fitting on this, uh, that would illuminate the difference, um, or there's a problem with the normalization. So uh, let's take a look at the post-edge region. So again, this is a good way to assess the quality of your normalization. So if you draw a straight line through one here, the oscillations of your post-edge region should more or less like be bisected by that line. So honestly, given how noisy these data are, most of this is, is okay. Um, the one spectra that seems to be an outlier is this orange one. You can see how it's, it seems to be sit much lower in energy than the others, and it's not being bisected by this, uh, Line, imaginary line at, at one. So to fix that, let's fix the normalization. This orange sample is uh, PFP. We'll go here. Let's plot and take a look at it. So uh, I'll plot the pre and post edge line. Um, I would definitely recommend watching the videos on our, our YouTube channel uh, for data normalization or and or honestly watch both uh, Matthew Newville's um, video on data normalization in uh, in large. Uh, where you'll go through more of these, the functionality of large. Um, but for the sake of this, um, I because I've played around with it, I know that it's the post-edge line that's the problem through this spectra. And so the post-edge line is controlled down here. So here I, I have this green line is, is the post-edge line. It's a polynomial. It's a third order polynomial. I could select a different order if I wanted to, but I know that a cubic uh, function works the best. And then this is the fitting range where it's fitting this polynomial. So here, um, I happen to know that if I, if I were to play around with this, if I didn't know uh, what it would take to get this orange line to you know, basically match up with the other spectra better, I would just play around with these values until it, it does. And it, it, you, know, you just go run through a few iterations and you can generally solve the problem. 
Uh, in this case, I happen to know that if I increase this from 100 to 150, that more or less, oops, that more or less solves the problem. And so now you can see that the orange line is, is kind of right in step with the other spectra. So I'm happy with this. So next, um, I've got all of my sample spectra checked. Let's go and like, obviously, right? So actually, let's just plot all of them again. So out of all these spectra, let's see how many uh, different components uh, may exist in the spectra. How many different standards do I need to fit these spectra? For that, um, I can do a PCA analysis. And we'll do this PCA on the flattened spectra. And we'll leave this fitting range as it is. And then we'll uh, load the PCA model. Or, I'm sorry, we'll build the PCA model. There we go. All right, so uh, PCA, um, if you want to know more about it, I'd, I'd refer you to some of our imaging videos. PCA is a really important tool in x-ray imaging. Um, but you can see uh, here we have seven components plus the mean of the data. So this is just all eight spectra averaged out, essentially, and then different components that explain the variation um, from the mean of the spectra. Um, here, this is the important plot. So this is a, a scree plot. Um, this is showing how many components are, are significant. So how many components do you need to explain the variance between the data and the mean uh, to a significant degree? So here, this is large is suggesting that four components are needed. Uh, the screen line, this is the IND value or the indicator value. Um, and to read the indicator value, you would read the minimum. So this is, is telling us the same thing. So where the indicator value forms a minimum, that's the number of components that you need to adequately reconstruct your data. Um, so in this case, uh, four components for both. <clears throat> so that's useful. Uh, we can now go on to the uh, actual linear combination fitting. So a couple of things about this. Um, obviously, I could play around with a lot of these standards. Um, but that might be a waste of time. So I'm going to use some knowledge that I have about these samples, about where they were taken from, and about the system, and about manganese chemistry in general to do my sample selection. So I'm going to select uh, none. And then um, I'm going to select nine, uh, nine standards, uh, three from each oxidation state of manganese 4, manganese 3, and manganese 2. Um, so to do this, I will start off with my three manganese 4 spectra. I'll select um, a couple of manganese um, 3 spectra and manganese phosphate, and then my manganese 2 spectra. So fun fungi, uh, this is a manganese 2, um, Manganese 2 associated with fungal mycelia, so it's supposed to be manganese 2 with organic matter is essentially what this is. Um, I'll do a tephrite and a pyroxamanganite, which are uh, manganese silicates, essentially. Um, and I'll use selected groups. So I have nine. Um, and then the sample I'm going to fit is this first sample. <clears throat> this will probably look familiar to you in a second. I'm going to fit this as the flattened because that's the, the properly normalized one. Um, and then for the fit range, uh, generally with your fit range, you want to fit 10 to 20 EV below the first feature in your in your spectra. So here, I uh, would be 10 to 20 EV below this pre-edge feature, um, and that's to minimize any contribution from like scattering uh, out at low energies. Um, and so I happen to know that that's at roughly 65, 25 EV. Um, and then here, uh, I you only if you're fitting zanes, you can fit zanes further up. But the scattering interactions that lead to zanes that are significant, you know, that are different from those that occur in exafs, those tend to end around a k of two or three, which in energy space means a roughly 30 eV above the edge. So you don't, you know, if you're just fitting zanes, you can make your window just down to about 30 EV above the edge. So in this case, that's about 6580 EV. Um, and then I'm going to unselect this. So you could do a combinatorial analysis where you'll, where you'll fit uh, nine combinatorial. So that's a, that's a lot of fits that I'd be asking. That'll take some time. I don't need to do that. Um, and then because uh, th these are standards that I got from a database, um, I'm going to allow the weights to not have to sum to one, but I, I know from experience it, it doesn't really matter if I enforce this or not. And then I'll lower this to, to four because this we four standards remember from the PCA analysis. So with that, I'll go and uh, fit this group. And you can see the fit is terrible. 
Um, this is expected, you should maybe recognize this. This is basically the fit that I showed you in the Hamilton test example. Uh, misfit just all over the place, it's misfit. So that's, that's no good. So this tells me that uh, again, I'm missing a standard. Luckily I know what that standard is. So I'll add that one back in, um, adding that in, there we go. And then we'll come back here and fix it. And unfortunately it, it refreshed all these values. So let me just readjust these. 580 um, and then do not fit all combinations and then fit this group. And there we go. That's a much cleaner fit. We're modeling the pre-edge, the edge, the shoulder, the white line pretty well. And then we're at least attempting to model this satellite feature. Um, so this is, this is good. So next what I would do um, if I wanted to get the oxidation state from this is I would save this fit and components. Um, and I would save this as a text file. It'll save just as a .dat file. Uh, we can save that somewhere. Um, and next, what I would do is I would then open up that file in Excel um, right here. And you can see uh, the weights. So the actual fitting weights are here along with each species that was used in the, in the fit. So for example, there was about 9% of this uh, manganese fungi that was, that was used um, and then if you want more specific values, you can come down here to the keyword variables um, and it'll show you the weighting. So again, right here, it's like some number two minus 10 to, times 10 to the negative 14th. So that's essentially zero as it's shown up here. Gives you an error for this. <clears throat> um, so if you want your errors, you can get them here. Um, anyway, I would take these numbers and bring them over here and paste them, paste them here paste the, the weights as well as their the components. I would take the valence of the manganese in each component and I get this value from uh, the publication. So this is one publication and then this is the publication for the Richterite sample. And remember this is the, this is the standard that saved us uh, with this. Uh, as you can tell, it's weighted, it's 83% of the total spectra. And it's assigned a valence of 2.5 in this, in this paper. Um, and you, likewise, you do the same for the errors. Um, you collect the errors, um, and then you can weight the errors by the valence. So over here, I've got the, the valence times the proportion. And over here, I've got the error times the valence. So both uh, the error has been propagated. I've attempted to propagate the error in a similar way to propagating the uh, valence. There are different ways you can do error propagation. Um, as long as you describe how you've done it um, so people know. I think that's probably the most important thing. And then I've summed the weighted valence and the weighted error. So the final uh, oxidation state for the sample is about 2.5 plus or minus uh, 0.3. Um, so it's a, essentially this could be a mixed valence, manganese 2, manganese 3 state where there's 50% manganese 2, 50% manganese 3. Or it could be like a silicate where the oxidation state of the manganese is actually about 2.5. Um, and you know, in, in all likelihood, there's actually a mixture of manganese phases in this sample, uh, with the predominant one being this manganese silicate here. So that's um, how the combo method works that's described in this paper. At least that's, that's one way. There are quite a few um, different techniques. You should read this paper. It's a very good paper, as well as this one. Um, so that's very useful. I want to show you uh, one more thing and then we'll be done with the tutorial. Uh, this one is in Athena. So I'm going to go ahead and close Athena, reopen it. And uh, once it's loaded, I, I want to show you one difference between Larch and Athena that I think can be kind of useful. Um, and that is, uh, here we go. So again, um, I've got this, I've got uh, five, yeah, five samples here. And then I've got 18 standards. And so you notice from large, you can only use 12 standards in your fit, but this, these are all the standards in the, uh, the paper that I showed you in that Excel file uh, for the combo method for fitting manganese average valence. So if I wanted to use all 18 of these standards like they outlined in that paper, I would probably need to do this in Athena or in like Origin or Igor or something like that, or in R even. Um, and to do this, right, go back to linear combination fitting. Uh, I'm going to use marked groups. I'm going to select the sample that I want to fit, which is this one. 
I'm going to not force all weights to sum to one. I'll say use at most maybe five standards. I haven't run the PCA on this. Um, and I'll go ahead and fit this group. And this will take a second because of how many standards there are. Um, and we can see here's the fit. Uh, the fit is very good for all features except for the pre edge, but as we've discussed, that's not surprising. Um, except for it appears that there is a, a negative component. So um, let's see if I force all the weights to sum to one if that goes away. Oops. Okay. So let's, uh, let's just try fitting this group again. Okay. So it's still there. So uh, I could just take this out. I could remove that and then reset all the values um, and then fit this group again. And it's a little negative. Interesting. Um, so I encounter this problem sometimes where the, the toggles don't quite work. So I'll toggle it on and off again. Let's remove this and I'll fit one last time. There we go. So now all the values are positive. Um, I don't know if it was removing it or toggling that on and off a couple of times that did it. Um, but now the values are positive. And so if you wanted to, you could repeat the same thing. You save the fit. Um, and then you can go to um, an Excel file, open the fit up and, and do your oxidation state calculation. In this case, the oxidation state is about three uh, plus or minus, right? There's always a, an error associated with this. So um, with that, uh, that's the tutorial. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Feel free to reach out to to us um, here at SSRL if you have questions. Um, generally, we're happy to help. Um, and best of luck with the rest of the summer school and with your XAS analysis.